So with all the talk about the importance of addressing climate change and moving to a clean energy economy, getting policies in place to do that, what's perhaps most striking is the fact that we have made almost no progress. Uh, climate global greenhouse gas emissions are not going down globally. We're not putting in place the policies we need. The idea of a global agreement on emissions uh, is clearly has failed. Uh, but there's a deeper problem with that, and that is that we simply have the wrong logic chain, if you will. How do we get from the point of not doing anything to the point of getting to this place where we're going to have the right policies in place to effectively address global climate change. So what's holding us back? What's really holding us back is, is that, as I said, we have this chain of illogic. To get to the point from starting at zero to how do we fix this problem with exactly the right policies, you have to start with the chain of logic. And unfortunately, that logic breaks down at different steps along the way. So the first assumption that people have to agree with before we can even do anything is that global warming is real. Secondly, that it's man-made. And third, that it's a problem. Now, most all environmentalists have those, that's not the issue for them. But it is the issue for some conservative groups who are either climate change deniers or who will acknowledge climate change but say that it's not man-made, or even some, like some economists who've asserted that climate change is actually going to benefit the globe because we'll be growing wheat in Manitoba and we'll be vacationing on the Hudson Bay. Not much you can do with those folks, although one of the reasons I would submit that they hold these rather strange views is because they worry that the policies that will be put in place if they give up on this denialism will be worse than the solution. The fourth thing we have to do is we have to recognize that it's not American warming, it's global warming, and that any solution we put in place has got to be a globally scalable solution. Unfortunately, way too many environmental advocates want to bring the old pollution model into the climate change model assuming and thinking that CO2 is no different than a NOx or SOx pollutant, and we address those through regulation. There's a lot of things wrong with applying that model to climate change. One of them is that the technology is completely different. It was actually pretty simple technology to address climate, to address NOx and SOx and other things. It's not at all to deal with carbon. But the more important problem is that we do care just as much about a ton of carbon being admitted from Kazakhstan as we do from Kansas. So this notion that somehow it, we can address the problem in America only is fallacious. Given the nature of the problem that uh, global warming uh, is real, that the emissions rates are going up, and that it is a persistent pollutant, if you will, in the atmosphere, we need to have a goal that gets greenhouse gas emissions as close to zero as possible. Now, there are some who would argue, well, if we just get a little more efficient in our use, if we just drive a little bit smaller cars, that we can get there. No, we have got to get close to zero as quickly as technologically possible because of the scale of the problem. How do we get to zero? Well, greenhouse gas emissions are simply a function of a rough equation, population times per capita GDP times greenhouse gas efficiency. So if we eliminated every single person on the planet, we would get to green zero. That would be one way to do it. We could have per capita GDP close to $10 a year. We wouldn't have any money to burn fuels. That would get us there. And now you can laugh and say, ha, ah, no one wants to do that. In fact, many people including so many environmentalists, argue that austerity and poverty is a way to get there. And if we just turn the te temperature down, if we just keep the Indians from getting uh, middle class incomes, that this is going to help the planet. Uh, not only is that moral, immoral uh, and unfair, uh, it simply won't do the job. So how do we get to do the job done? We We've got to do it through zero greenhouse gas energy sources. Now again, that seems obvious. But again, many of the advocates suggest, well, we could do it if we just 
adopt cleaner technologies like natural gas. Again, natural gas doesn't get us there. It's cleaner, but it's not zero. Or that we could just all insulate our homes or drive smaller cars. Again, efficiency is useful. It gets us a little bit farther down the road, but it gets us nowhere near zero. Okay, so we've got the goal of zero carbon, zero greenhouse gas energy sources. How do we get them deployed? How do we get them widely used so that they, get, they, they displace coal plants, that they displace internal combustion engines? Well, this really, number eight, is the core crux of the argument and the debate. Uh, I, I can't think of another more important one. This is where we get hung up. So if the first way we get hung up is on one, two, and three with the climate deniers, this eight, number eight is the other big area where we get hung up. We get hung up there because many, in fact, frankly, almost all of the green of the climate advocates, the climate writers, they almost all focus on if we just force people to adopt clean technology, existing generations of it, we will get there. Now the problem with that is current clean technologies are nowhere near competitive in price or performance with fossil fuels. We have uh, electric cars now on the market and they're hardly selling, even with a major tax incentive to buy them. Why is that? Because the batteries don't have enough range and they cost more than regular cars. Unless you mandate or massively subsidize them, that's not going to happen. Now even if we did mandate or massively subsidize in this country, other countries are not going to do that. And so again, what we need, for example, in vehicles is we need to have batteries that are super cheap with massive range. That's when people are going to say, why would I want that gas guzzler? Boy, oh boy, I want that electric car. What people will argue is we will just have innovation and that's going to happen automatically. We don't have to have an innovation policy. And that gets us to the next one and the last one, number nine. How do we get cheap and efficient and effective clean energy that's cheaper and better than fossil fuels. Well, the only way to do that is about supporting research, development, demonstration, and what we call smart deployment. This notion that if we were to just scale up all of the wind turbines we have today and make them ten times more uh, produced, and produce ten times more of the existing solar panels, that just through economies of scale, that the price of those things will come down. Uh, to be cheaper than fossil fuels simply is not true. Historically, how innovation has happened in industries like semiconductors, we, didn't, we don't have the computer speeds and prices we have today because we scaled up the 086 computer processor. It didn't matter how cheap you could make an 086. We went to a, a 286, a 386. We ended up going to now Xenon and just massively, massively better core, quad, uh, massively better chips, quad core. 8 core. That was done through innovation. That wasn't done through scale up. Now once you innovate and then you scale, you can get price declines even more. But in other words, we've got to get better technologies. And that doesn't mean no deployment support, but we've got to have smart deployment support. That leads to this notion that the only way we can address and get to a zero carbon uh, global energy economy is through significantly more support for global R&D and D, globally and smart deployment. Now there's two things I'll just conclude with. One, one of the arguments we hear about this is the, the urgency is so great, the climate is burning, if we don't act now we're not going to get there. Well the problem with that argument, it's true, the problem with that is it's analogous to somebody with terminal cancer where there's no cure, but we say, well, instead of spending our resources trying to find the cure before they die, we're going to give them existing medicines which at best prolong their lives a few years. We, we need to find the cure. That's going to solve the problem, even though the problem is urgent and critical. And the second part is this view that so many of the advocates have, and they'll say, Oh yeah, we think we need innovation, but what they really, really mean is that innovation is something on the side. We hear that, for example, from Joe Rahm with the, new, with the Center for American Progress, and Joe Rahm, in response to our work, has said, 
what we need to do is deploy, 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 R&D, deploy, deploy, deploy. We hear that with the advocates of carbon price, who would essentially, in the same frame as Joe Rahm, would say price, 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 R&D, price, price, price. Or the deploymentist who would say uh, that we've got to just keep deploying. The fact is we have to make tough choices. We can't have it all. We've got to make choices about where we're going to put our resources. And frankly, the only way we're going to get there is with much stronger innovation policy. So I would say it's time for us to get the logic chain right.